Can a rare and limited smoke wagon defeat the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection Eagle Rare 17 year old? My taster today is Kevin Martin from Candlebox. We're about to find out. Here we go. The Fred Minnick Show is brought to you by 291 Colorado Whiskey and by Michter's American Whiskeys. And joining the Fred Minnick Show is the great Kevin Martin of uh, Candlebox. How you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm good. I'm ready to jump right in. <laughs> right on. Well, you know, I know you're a whiskey drinker. How long you been uh, been drinking uh, the good whiskey? Uh, I'd say probably around... 25 years oh nice yeah pretty much started, i started mid 90s when uh, the band was going we started yeah. out drinking a lot of vodka. so Got so after it. there was a little bit of success you know you know the you probably upgraded a little bit from time to time from like everclear to to something good well from kettle one vodka good whiskey <laughs> what what did bands drink in the 90s uh for the most part in uh in the in the world of uh when you were like on tour like what did all the bands drink back then most of the time it was beer i mean that was kind of, i mean being from seattle that was really the i guess maybe because it was it, it, there weren't any bars if you didn't have a restaurant you could have a bar right so um, it was a lot of taverns so we drank a lot of you know the, the microbrews or uh red hook uh rainier stuff like that and I think when we started touring, it was pretty much the same thing or rolling or something like that. Um, rarely did you get a bottle of anything on your rider. Um, it's pretty much just beer. Um, and then, of course, people got into the Jagermeister thing. Um, and tequila was a big uh, and A lot of people drank um, Seagram 7, which um, was something I stayed away from. So Seagram 7 what? I just found Seagram 7 sweet, um, way too, uh, I don't know, hangover-ish, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that was never, never good whiskey at any point uh, in, in its day. Uh, it was basically made for Coca-Cola, so, you know, and, and alcoholics going to parking lots at 9 in the morning. So... I, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, 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 um, you... This is going to be a weird story, and you're probably going to be like, who the fuck is this guy? I'm, I'm out. Uh, you know, thank God he sent me good whiskey. But I had uh, I had this girlfriend when I was in high school, so, you know, mid-90s. And she would, she only would listen to Candlebox. And I'd put on, like, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, anything else. And she's like, no, you're turning it back to, to Candlebox. And that was like, that was the only way I could get my groove on. Like, you know, it was if I was playing Cannonbox. So I had like, I wore out, I wore out so many tapes in that, in that deck player and that old, uh, that old Dodge pickup truck. So I kind of like talking to you and like, you know, doing my research and everything. It took me back to when I was a much thinner young man, um, with more hair <laughs> and, and like a pickup truck that b barely started half the time. So yeah. thank you for those for those glorious days in my teenage years. Well, you know, it's funny. A lot of people said I lost my virginity too far behind. I can <laughs> safely say I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And, you know, the, the 90s were – that was such a trip. But that we definitely know what that – with that – what that generation of, of music was and it you know it's still alive and, and well today and Candlebox is still going baby it's it's amazing We're still kicking. it's it's amazing to see the longevity um that you all have had especially when we've lost so many great ones from this genre and um you know it you know breaks my heart every every time it happens, um, and and I know it's much closer for you, but I I, there, I think there's something to be said for a band that can keep it together for as long as you all have, and and really you know you know be a, a unit 
And so my hat's off to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, the fun part for us now is the is the whiskey. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through some like some tasting training with you, and we'll start with the with the bottle of Michter's. All right. Now you gave me barrel strength. I gave you barrel strength. <laughs> I, I, I got I'll myself. See you later. Let's see here. Uh, I got. I don't have barrel. I got. I got the regular one here. So we're going to. Uh, I got the regular small batch. Can you? Are you good to hand to do some uh, some cast strength action? Absolutely. So the journey, the journey of bourbon, uh, really begins with with kind of analyzing the color. You know, when it goes into the to the barrel, it's as clear as the water from your tap. So every every single day, it's in that wood. It's moving in and out of uh, of the wood, extracting all the color and the majority of its um, majority of its. Uh, how should I put this? The um, flavor and aroma is coming from the barrel. So, like the color is kind of like an indication of the experience to come so the darker it is usually means the older it is and um and the higher and proof so you know mine is mine is the small batch so it's not the full-blown cast drink but uh it's definitely got some nice color to it. yours is i mean look at that that's a rich amber right there yeah you can see that's beautiful and the aroma is amazing and when you smell it is one of my favorites Nice. Well, I'm I'm yeah. glad I sent you a full bottle. Then you can you can sip on that for a while. And that cash drink is hard to get. So that's a special. That's, a... that's going to be gone by this evening. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Now, will you cut? Will you will you sing or play? Uh, will you go back into like you know you you're half a bottle in a bourbon? Do you go back to the French horn or any of those instruments that you used to play, or do you just like um, just kick back and? I don't have any of those instruments anymore. Uh, they belong to the school. Um, I what I tend to do is, I'll, if I've had maybe two good drinks, it'll, it's time to pick up the acoustic and start working on some stuff. Mm, okay. Um, but I, you know, I drink I drink whiskey the whole the whole show that I'm on stage. Wow! Uh, Not everyone does that. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid it like it'll mess with their voice. Or something. Well, I found that it's the one thing that actually keeps my voice in shape, which is kind of crazy to say, but um, it, it does. I mean, over the 30 years that I've been singing, um, I've only lost my voice four times, I think, in, in wow. the period. And this is one of the reasons. I mean, this thing keeps it well lubricated, you know, so it's. <laughs> Absolutely. I keep telling myself that. So smelling, it is. The, the t- a technique of smelling can be like opening your mouth a little bit and kind of go side by side. When you open your mouth, you you can you can actually pick up more of the flavor and or that you know that's to come just by because you're relaxing your olfactory and you can pick up more. Uh, and then side by side because your nose will actually each nostril works very differently. So you kind of yeah. go by side by side with your mouth open up a little bit. Can make a, it can make a real difference. Um, and then when you taste, you put it on your tongue and f- kind of focus what part of the tongue is it hitting. And if it's on the tip, that's where you get your sweet notes. The middle is where like the savory is. The bitterness is in the middle toward the back. And then the spice is uh, all the way toward the back. And you'll also get some bitterness there. So I like to get people to like taste, think about what part of the tongue it's hitting, and then really try to focus on what flavors they are accustomed to uh, that are in that region. This one hits me <clears throat> pretty much in the back. It's pretty, it's pretty warm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got a, it's got a nice heat to it. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a uh, cinnamon. Maybe that's from the, from the cast. Well, that's that where, in. that's where the back, uh, the back palate action would be. Yeah. For sure. And I taste, um, I taste oddly enough. I taste like a, a little bit of a, blackberry maybe uh maybe that's oh. like a smoke or something mm. uh you just said blackberry smoke and i was like oh wow well, that's it's actually a band great band yeah, yeah. it's a great band you ever played with beautiful. them we've done some festival shows with them but never never took okay. how, how does that Which work is- so 
you're you're like um you know you're in the higher echelon of like these festivals so you'll be on that first or second line do you go back and hang out with like bands you've never met before i know you're a big fan of like bands a lot of people a lot of bands that people haven't discovered yet like who do you like to hang out with at these festivals it depends a lot of the bands we play with don't show up until like right before they go on stage um yeah. so you can't really hang out with them all day but if it's, if it's somebody like Seether or uh, Shine Down or um, I guess most of the bands we play with, yeah, we we're hanging out all day um, just because we've known one another so long, and it's nice to catch up, uh, yeah. see what you know families are doing and that sort of thing. But rarely do we sit around, you know, uh, you know, wait, waiting to play. It's really just trying to keep ourselves busy so you're not bored. I mean. Touring is extremely exhausting, and a lot of times I'll sleep until twelve or one in the afternoon, <laughs> just That's, because it's just it's tiring, you know. Well, I mean, it, you know, I'm more if you can sleep if, if you are allowed to sleep that long, I, I would sleep that way every single day. Like, I, yeah. I, I mean, more sleep the better. Am I? Am I pretty special? I, and I know your 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 father was uh, served. I was I was. Uh, I was uh, military and you know served well, thank and you I for your service. Ser- thank you. I know you're you're very you're always very vocal about your father's service and and I even heard you say that you know you think more about like him on Omaha Beach than than you do selling records. So I, I appreciate yeah. that you saying that about your father. Um, but I was my point to that is is that the military maybe get up so early. I feel like I'm still catching up. Uh, from the sleep dep- deprivation that I had, yeah. so uh, that's why I, I'm all for like sleeping 12 hours a day. So yeah, it's a good it's a good routine. So now let's jump to let's jump to 291. Now this is a um, I, I have this is a, a brand in Colorado. Uh, they finished their stuff with Aspen Staves, so they're doing something. Honestly, it's Aspen Staves. Uh, so you know, like the aspen tree, they get little pieces of the aspen oh. tree and like uh, and like put them in little bitty, cut them up in little bitty pieces, and they put them in the barrel, and it adds like a little layer, a little smoke to it. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a very very, you know, powerful, kind of pungent uh, flavor that will come from it. Now I, I will say that a lot of traditional bourbon drinkers do not like this brand, but people who like Scotch and or have a or have a kind of a little bit more like uh, curious palate uh, often often find two ninety one to be exceptional. It's interesting, beautiful. The aroma is pretty special. And I can see the scotch. I can smell the scotch element of what people are picking up. Without the peat, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. Um, honey. What else am I tasting there? Wow, that is a really beautiful whiskey. That's a zipper. Yeah, that is a that is a small, tiny brand in Colorado Springs. They do a really bang up job. Um, uh, but whiskey, whiskey is always about the people for me and the relationships. And, um, you know, you, just, I kind of, I, I cover these folks and you, I, I, there's not really any bad people in the whiskey business. Um, or at least in the distiller side, you know, the people who sell it, they can be turds, but the people who uh, the, <laughs> create, create the whiskey are usually pretty cool. That is a... God, there's so much happening on your tongue with that, isn't it? Um, 
the front, the middle, the back. Uh, that would be good to heal a wound. <laughs> you could you could heal a wound with this, yeah, absolutely. Maybe some heartbreak uh, as well. What's, you know? the, what's the proof on that? Uh, it's it's usually north of like one twenty, so one twenty point two. Yeah, yeah, they're they're typically very hot now. Every bottling they they do small barrels, so their bottlings are very they vary quite a bit, and they do a lot of blending. So you know they're a little bit all over the place with their with their proof points. I'm not yeah blended blended are something that like I I've, I've never really been, like even with a, a scotch uh, or, yeah. or whiskeys and Johnny Walker I don't like it um, it just, just I think it's too complex for me hmm. you know but that's really beautiful you know what's interesting the term blend uh, does have kind of a dirty word and it does mean something but really in a, in the American styles of whiskey uh, there's a there's a category of blended whiskey that has neutral grain spirit going into it, essentially vodka. And it's like 75% neutral grain spirit. And, uh, the rest is like what we would consider whiskey, but there's a category that's called blend of straight. And that's where they take a bunch of different, uh, basically bourbons from various States and composite them together and don't really do anything else. But because of the code and how it's written, they have to be called blend of straights. And, the the actual mingling or marrying of barrels is technically called blending, but they have uh, found every word in the book to not call, you know, they call it marriage, they call it mingling, <laughs> composites, uh, but they try to avoid the word blend as much as possible. It's funny. Key, key party? Yeah. <laughs> so That's great. So, you know, your, the, the music video – that you did underwater uh, definitely would not get approved today. And you just went back, right? Didn't you just go back to that area for the first time mm -hmm. since you did that video? Did yeah. you did you have some like PTSD or anything like that? Like just looking at the water? No, you know, it's interesting. I, when we did that video, Gus Van Zandt uh, had approached us about, about doing some work with us because he, was a fan and he always kind of felt like we were misrepresented and kind of not treated with the same respect as the other Seattle bands. And of course, being who he is and you know, a gay director in Hollywood, and he was kind of a champion of ours. So he approached us about doing this video down in uh, Marathon, Florida. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I, I scuba dive. It's something that I, I enjoy doing. So I was really looking forward to it. The, the rest of the guys were a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, we had to do two days worth of scuba training for them. And um, then we jumped right into it. I was not uncomfortable with it at all. I really didn't even know when I held my breath for that one minute lip sync that it was a full minute. I was just doing what, you know, kind of uh, the training I'd had of, of diving and swimming. That, that's something that you do is the way you hold your breath and do it. Um, when I came up... <laughs> Everybody was freaking out. Uh, Gus was freaking out. The guys in the band were like, are you okay? Are you, can you breathe? I was like, I'm fine. What's the big deal? I'm like, that was a full minute. And I was like, really? I didn't... Okay, cool. So it was nice. Actually. I didn't get to get back in the water when I was in Key West, um, unfortunately, but I, I, I would love to do some diving there again. It's really beautiful. and It's, it's a lovely little town, and um, the people are amazing. And uh, I would do that video again in a heartbeat. It was an absolute blast. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a great place to drink. That's for sure. Yes, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good little uh, cocktail bars there. Some uh, get, get, get some fine mojitos. I mean, Ernest Hemingway, that yeah. guy. I mean, he he really put that place on the map from a drinking perspective. He yeah. certainly did. And there are a lot of great bars there. Absolutely. So, uh, so now what we are going to do? I'm. You are now. Now that you got a little touch of training in you, it's kind of like being diver certified. <laughs> We are now going to do – I'm not going to tell you what you're tasting. I don't know okay. what we are tasting. I know the brands that are in this lineup. Okay. You cannot buy these brands. So these are all highly allocated, exceptionally rare, hard to get, and uh, we, are, we only know them as uh, A, B, and C for this tasting. And so you and I, we are going to taste these together, and we are going to um, – uh, 
rank them as if we were grading them for a professional tasting. And then at the end, I've got the results right here. Um, you, know, you can see, like, Allison does a very good job making sure I can't get in them. So they're all, uh, <laughs> they're all Fred proof, if you will. And uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's start with uh, glass A, and then we'll just kind of taste and talk. And, uh, you know, a little bit in between. A little bit of that, a little bit of this. Mm-hmm. Light color. Yeah, coming off the two that you just had, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Nice aroma. Not too much. Yeah, there's a touch of like um there's a touch of like uh, oak in here that mm -hmm. that always makes me a little nervous. Yeah, like they're, it, they're tainting it maybe. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of over oaked. Uh, a lot of people like a lot of oak. I I do not. Um I, I like oak to be a part of it, but I don't like to be the whole conversation on the whiskey. It's almost like I would imagine it's a lot like um you know, guitars for you. Like, I mean, you love you love a good guitar riff. You love solos. But there's always that one guitarist who thinks he's the number one guy in the entire world and he has to take up, you know, three <laughs> minutes for a solo. Like, bro, you're not that great, yeah. you know? <laughs> I think I've had that guy before. <laughs> All right, here we go to the taste. This makes me think of um, like a Basil Hayden dark rye. It is definitely tasting unlike what I thought. So I know the three things the that, we, that are in here, but it is not tasting to me anything remotely close. Um, like what I recall from the previous tastings with these three. Oh, from the mixtures and the yeah, not... like holy crap! But there is a there is a really warming kind of like a, a caramel drizzle in this. It's not a big note, but it's like it's like the caramel that you would put on uh, on some ice cream, like a like a yeah, I agree or with you. A, and a little bit of vanilla too. A little bit of fudge, you said? No, vanilla. Oh, vanilla. Okay. I'm getting a little vanilla. That's nice. I could drink that. It is definitely a lot lighter than what we've been sipping on, though. So in this in this 25-year bourbon career here, is there – do you have a uh, – do you have a go-to? A little book when I can find it. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And so Little Book is a blend of straights uh, I know. that I was telling yeah. you about. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just – I was looking at the bottle when you were saying it because it's sitting right in front of me. I'm like, <laughs> that's a blended straight. Yeah. Yeah, so Little Book uh, is a Jim Beam product uh, made by <laughs> the um, – uh, Freddie No, who is the grandson of Booker No. And, you know, he's in his 20s, one of these, you know, young up-and-coming – uh, fellas in the industry uh he's a descendant of the jim beam and just a really really great dude and i, I didn't know that. I, yeah I, I wish i knew that little book was your uh was, was your favorite uh i'll see if i can't get him to uh send you a couple signed bottles or something i would love that man it's amazing it's it's literally if i can find it i buy it i don't even care what it costs yeah it's good it's good and then and, and some years are better like the and and what I what I what I find fascinating about that series is that they will say like we had a 16 year old corn whiskey and a 15 year old beer. I'm like, how do you all have all this whiskey? You're always complaining you don't have enough you whiskey. Have any. <laughs> you know, it's like and you just pull this shit out of the warehouse. Yeah, oh, that's why like whiskey whiskey distillers. You just you know sometimes they uh, they fib a little bit. Sure. They have to. Uh, for my 50th birthday, the guys in the band got me a bottle of Pappy uh, 15. 
And about a year afterwards, I was in Los Angeles. Uh, well, I live in LA, but I was at the, the Chateau Marmont. And um, there's this gentleman sitting at the end of the bar. Said, the bar there is really tiny. And um, I, my wife drinks Claus Azul Reposado. And, and so I was getting her tequila. And, uh, and I ordered a, a, a little bit of, they have Pappy there as well. Yeah. So I ordered myself a glass of that. And it wasn't, you know, it's not cheap, but I can sip on it for a long time. So it doesn't matter to me. So he's like, what's that tequila? And I turn, I said, oh, that's Azul's beautiful Reposado and the bottles are amazing, etc. My wife loves it. If I don't get this for her, then I don't get what I need tonight later when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, yeah, I've not heard of that." And I said, uh, "What do you, what do you drink?" He said, "Well, I'm in the whiskey business, but I'm out here for my daughter starting a, a, a mezcal." And I was oh. like, "Oh, which one?" He's like, "Yolo." And I, said, I haven't heard of it. He said, "Well, we're just launching now." And he said, "I'm in the business, so I told her I'd help her out." Uh, but he said, "I'm in the whiskey business," and he said, "I like what you're sipping on there." And I said, "Oh." It's, you know, you know, you know, Pappy's amazing, but when you can find it, you drink it. And, and if you can afford it, you can drink it. And he's like, well, how do you know about it? And I said, well, I've been drinking it for years, but I said, my guys in my band, I just turned 50, gave me a bottle of their 15 uh, year old and it's signed on the back. And he's like, really? Said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, that's my signature. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I'm, I'm Julian Van Winkle. And he gave me his card and, and we talked about whiskey for about ten minutes. <laughs> it was amazing. Julian, that is, that is uh, quintessential Julian right there. That yeah. that is you know he that is how he rolls, man. He will he will do that. He likes to play that play around a little bit. He's a great guy, uh, and he's yeah. done and he does a lot for charity. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll he's cool. I'll, I'll text him after this and be like, "Hey, this is a, this is a good story." Oh yeah, let's see if he remembers me. Yeah. I, I could right now, but it could throw my entire computer off. And uh, with you know, with all he, the- he did tell me not to open it. Uh, he said that's a that's a very special bottle, and if I've signed it, it's it's going to be worth something someday. So don't. Open uh, and it. So, and I have so it. that was when you would have got that. It was 2019, three years ago. So yeah. okay, uh, yeah, that won my that won my American Whiskey of the Year. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah, so that was that was the year that it won my won my best whiskey. That's amazing. Stupidly, before I knew about Pappy, this is this is another crazy story. A very good friend of mine who um, lives in Kentucky works for well, used to work for um, the Van Winkles, and uh, she gave me she won the lottery with a twenty five year old bottle. Oh, and I didn't know about Pappy, and this is about about two thousand nine or ten, and uh, we drank it. It was delicious, but stupidly we drank it. But I mean, I think see, so you say stupidly, but I'm like, that's why we buy them, right? That's why we get True. these. And sure, uh, a bottle of Red Hook Rye just went for forty five thousand dollars at auction. Absolutely, yeah. Someone, someone earned a mint. Uh, yeah. But I, if if we are always if we are like just we look at bottles and we just think of them for what they will bring us i mean i think there's some danger in like just not enjoying life with that because that's what yeah. this stuff is meant to be it's, it's meant to ameliorate a moment give you some like joy um you know maybe maybe you drink it on stage next time you know it's like uh, I think that's what i'll do <laughs> take the 15 year old just like put it right you know, there on the couch yeah. <laughs> hey guys who wants a sip yeah i mean <laughs> You'd be the most popular guy uh, with that stage crew, you know. For a, for a minute. For, yeah, that's right. Until uh, that is true. They they like you until they don't like you. You know, I've mm. been I've been I've been run off backstage before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I I, I was at so last um, I'm I'm good friends with Scott Ian of Anthrax, and I was uh, backstage with him uh, at one of his shows, and I got. Um, I mean, those, those guys like change things like every five seconds, I feel like. And yeah. so I was like in between sound booth guy and changing guy. And, um, I got, I got pushed away pretty quickly from the yeah, so tech, guitar with, tech. Yeah. I, I got away from guitar, guitar tech guy. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I was backstage with, with the, what you would think would be the most complicated, uh, setup and moving parts was actually very insulated and like there was like nothing really going on outside of like a small little group 
Now, Slipknot. Slipknot is, like, so self-contained, and they don't even, like, put their masks on near anybody. I mean, it's, like, all, like, it's it's all, like, secret. It's, like, this little yep. little cape is up, and everything's happening, happening you know, beyond the cape. Uh, but uh, I've done a lot of backstage shows, and it, there's not a... There's not a, a, a memorable or enjoyable enjoyable experience that's better than like being in the crowd for me. I, I, I'd much rather be in the crowd than backstage. I agree with you. <clears throat> we have people all the time that we've known for years. And we go, Can I get passes to backstage? And it's like, why? We don't yeah. do anything. You know, uh, it's it's not like we have you know, strippers and drugs and all that sort of stuff laying around. We just kind of sit around and wait for the show. You know, and and yeah. uh, maybe have some vegetables from from the vegetable platter. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, the only thing I could ever think of that was remotely cool uh, is the is the crowd surfing. Like if you're at a show, there's a lot of crowd surfing. You can see some wild shit. You know, if you are yeah. backstage. Uh, but I used to do that a lot when I was a kid, but not anymore. Is, is there been crowd surfing to a candle box at a show? Oh yeah, back in the day. I actually almost got arrested in Cincinnati. <clears throat> I didn't know we were doing a concert uh, at Bogarts. And apparently since the Who concert there, which was 76 when everybody got trampled, um, they had passed a law. There was no uh, inciting a riot or whatever they call it. And so we were at the peak of our career and <clears throat> stage diving, pulling kids up on stage and they were jumping off and I was jumping off. And the next thing I know, my tour manager comes to me about halfway through the set. He's like, you need to leave the venue immediately. And um, we shut the show down and he put me in a cab and I got sent back to the hotel. And uh, I didn't know what was going on. And the, the manager of the venue had called the police to have me arrested for inciting a riot. And wow. uh, it was the first time I ever experienced anything like that, you know, that was... And I was very concerned, obviously, because you don't want anybody to get hurt. But, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do at a rock and roll show, you know. I mean, and that's what the Seattle yeah. bands were known for and the punk bands were known for. Punk bands were known for is that same thing. It's like to, you enjoy that moment. You're, you're jumping out there and having uh, people carry you around and stuff. That's what everybody's looking for you to do. So it was, it was strange. And, and uh, I never – I remember going to the manager of the club's like, why did you call the club? All you had to do was come up to me. They tell me that I can't do that, and I would stop. You know, but um, I was a rebel. Yeah, well, and probably the last time you played that venue. <laughs> no, we played all that great venue. He's not there anymore, though. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, fuck that guy. Jeez, <laughs> calling the cops. Um, what a dick. So let's go to glass B bit. now. So yeah. pour, you, pour yourself some B on up in here. Pour yourself some B. Get on in now. Mm-hmm. Woo! Good. Similar light color. Lord, that smells good. That is delicious. Good God. That's all up in my nose. That's really very... Lots going on there. Definitely. That's got, for me, that's got another little bit of the vanilla smell. This is, um, this has so much going on with it. Mm. This is fan friggin' tastic. That is beautiful on the tongue. Man. This has like a, like a chocolate peanut cluster thing, like those little turtle peanut cluster chocolate things. That's what I was gonna say. Good. A little. Yeah. This this is. That's lovely. This is dangerous be right here. Of this. Yeah. Holy shit! This is good. Yeah, it makes me think of that little, like a little chocolate with the toffee and. Either peanut in it or an almond in it. Yeah, and it's spicy. It's, it's got a nice spice to it. Mm. It's the spice of life, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> that's really lovely. 
It's got some nice legs on it too. Yeah, it really does. It's beautiful. Hmm. Lovely. You gotta know what that one is. So how was the? Uh, you all had a new uh, new record come out. Was it late last year? It came out in August of last year. Yeah, it was supposed to come out in August of 2020. We recorded it in August of 2019. Okay. Um, and because of pandemic, everything got delayed. So uh, it came out last August and debuted at number seven, which is great, which means we sold like 10,000 records. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the, uh, the, the whole the whole streaming thing has really kind of cannibalized the ability to make money uh, for a new album um, uh, in, in your situation. I. I got to say, like, I'm not a musician. I, I have my only talent is tasting whiskey. So I got to say, like, I would not want to be a, a new band coming out right now because because of the economics of it all. No, I'd say that all the time. I mean, these kids we play with, um, you know, we, we have a lot of times we choose local to play with us. Um, the promoter will sit in bands and, and, we, and I listen to them. I want to know, you know, who's playing with us and what, is, what style's like and, and the vibe. And um, I tell them all the time, God, how the, how the hell are you guys doing this? I mean, it's got to be the most frustrating thing in the world because if you don't have a genius working your socials, uh, who's going to find out about you? Yeah. It's next to impossible. The one, the one genre that I have seen a lot of success in uh, has been country. Like a lot of country artists have have figured out how to, you know, create personality and turn it into, you know, music and then handbags or or something else. It seems like that genre has done a really good job of how to make money outside of music. And you don't see that a lot with rock. And I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, do you you know, is there something there with rock that, you know, the the genre just doesn't seem to be. It's just so focused on music and it can't get out of that bubble or is it just not natural to, to think outside of, of, uh, of music in some ways? Well, there are, you know, bands have beers and, you know, um, whiskeys and vodkas and, you know, Absolutely. stuff like that. But it takes a while to get there. It's actually interesting because Candlebox talking about doing a whiskey a couple of years ago before the pandemic. I met with the guys from Buzzard. And we were talking about doing some stuff with them. Um, but it's, I think mainly people expect you in the rock and roll world to just make rock and roll records. They don't, your audience doesn't really want to, you know, see you on a whiskey bottle or, or, or a beer can. It's not as acceptable as it is in the country world. The country vibe is a pickup truck and beer or, or, you know, Jack Daniels or something like that with the, you know, uh, a dog and a, and a wife who left you. Um, <laughs> rock and roll is cocaine and hookers, you know. And you can't really market that. <laughs> it, it is hard to market cocaine and hookers, that is true. <laughs> Except in that's the whiskey talk. Movies, that's okay. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. The, the whiskey, you know, the whiskey gets... Uh, you know, it does it does help with the flow of an interview. It makes it a little easier, but I, I do know I, I do know that uh, in having listened to a lot of interviews that other people do, I, I I could not ask people questions without drinking whiskey with them. I just <laughs> I, I I mean I could, but it would just be boring as shit to me, you know. Yeah. So I, I think the whiskey makes us all of this better for me at least. <laughs> well, at least it, it makes you honest. That's right. That's right. Now, so your wife, your wife is in the clothing business, right? So, Jesus. all right. So, um, now I'm like one of five people in this world who still wear ascots. So, do you think that there's any way that your wife can help bring back ascots in the, in the clothing industry uh, instead of them, <clears throat> instead of them just being in like you know, estate sales and secondhand uh, stores. Because uh, as it is now, only Charles Woodson and myself uh, are the only people who really wear them of any notoriety. And, there, you know, and there's a few here and there. But we lost uh, Hugh Hefner. He was a big ass guy. Yeah, he was. But, uh, Matt Storm, so, 
from Guns N' Roses. He wears them. Does he really? Yeah, yeah. Mm. He's a big fan. I didn't know that. Well, the interesting thing is my wife's stuff is uh, silk and it's all uh, hand printed in uh, Indonesia. So it's uh, all you know done by hand, silk screens, beautiful stuff. Um, and she could easily get into that world. I mean, that's how Ralph Lauren started with, with ties. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll pitch that to my wife. She's got some beautiful designs and, and uh, they would look fantastic on you. Well, I will say this. Silk is the preferred material it is. for ascots. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would also say that uh, they would have to be extremely limited runs, like maybe five, uh, okay. in order for her to do a successful business campaign. Because it's hard to get people to wear them. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, but, you know, hairstyles and a lot of these young hip uh, artists will start wearing them. But I tell you what, I'll talk to her about it. Uh, if I get five made up, uh, I'll send them to you. That, there we go. See, it's a start, <laughs> right? You know, the thing <laughs> is, is the fashion world, you know, I have to apply, I have to apply um, pressure where I can, you yeah. know, to get someone thinking and talking about it because. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, it it's going to be it, it's never going to happen. But uh, you know, sad story. But people who wear them on TV, they get told to stop wearing them because yeah. it it has like a it has like an offensive connotation to it to some people. Like people look at this and they think snob or think that somebody wearing an ascot it feels like they're better than them. When really, it's the easiest thing in the world to tie, and. Um, and, you know, when you're wearing an ascot, you're not looking at someone's shoes. So I walk around yeah. in tennis shoes everywhere I go. So Do you say, do you say that my eyes are up here? That's right. That's it. <laughs> they see the ascot, and they're just like, uh, oh, the ascot. And, and, and you do have to have some balls to wear them. You know, that you is do. true. You, gotta, you got some balls, son. You, you, can't, you can't just be some – you got to have some confidence. And so, yeah. you know, that is what it is. But – you know, if you can get her to even remotely consider it, that's a big win for me. Well, I'm big, just going to do win. it. I'm partners with her in a company, so I'm going to make up five for you and some of her. Books there we go. Silks and we'll see what happens. So, true story. I actually did try my own line for a little bit, and really? uh, I sold two of them. I sold two of them. Now, I didn't, I didn't have a big national campaign or anything like that. I mean, I tried to sell them to my audience, which for the whiskey community is pretty large. And I tried to sell them at a festival that had, uh, you know, like 50,000 people over two days. I sold two ascots, Kevin. Two. Out of 50,000 people. Out of 50 fucking thousand people. That's sad. It is horrible. Do those people know how good they would have looked wearing those? Yeah, I think they mostly just see them and see like sex, you know, sex related things, which is fine too. But, um, yeah, they didn't buy them. They're great on the wrists. That's true. They'll tie you up. Now, with that said, let's go to Glass C. <laughs> hey, what do you think about this uh, bourbon fest that's coming up? What's it called? Bourbon in, in Kentucky in September. Bourbon and Beyond? Yeah. Is so, I, uh, yeah, I actually uh, co-created that with, uh, with Danny Wimmer. No so, shit. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a pretty, pretty rocking lineup. Danny's great. <clears throat> pretty, pretty rocking lineup. Yeah, it's beautiful this year. I'm kind of pissed we're not on it. Thanks for that. I have nothing to do with the artists. <laughs> I just, I kind of help set them, get set up with the bourbon and everything. And uh, I have nothing to do with the ascots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. Definitely a unique color. That's dark. Yeah. Looks like maybe they burned it. Like Starbucks. Did I just say that out loud? Sorry, my bad. Mm. Not a fan of Starbucks, huh? Hmm. I'll drink it. This is this is good. Oh wow. I actually find this to be very like syrupy. Mm. Like like drinking ma maple syrup straight out of the jar yeah it has a little bit of that kind of knob creek maple maple Ooh. this i'm gonna guess what this is oh wow and you it have tastes no like that 
Uh, He's got no data going in, folks. This is a, this is a blind guess. <clears throat> Jim. I could certainly enjoy this. It would take some time, though. I'd probably have to. I'm going to say this, and it's sad that I'm going to say this. I'd probably have to put this in a big ice cube. Okay. But it's good. Hmm. I like I like the spice. Mm -hmm. I can't pick a specific spice or nut in it. Actually, I think I might like it more than I'm saying. It almost has like a Brazilian nut to it. Uh, like a bitterness, there's a bitterness mm. there, but also like a like a meatiness. A little bit of coffee. Yeah, I can see that hazelnutish. Mm. It's got a yeah. lot of as it as it sits as it sits. Yeah, it's got a lot going on, but I want something else with that. I want a cigar. Um, yeah. I want. Yeah, I want I want something else. Yeah, this would be great with a cigar, you're right. You smoke cigars? I do. Yeah. And you were, like, you were like breaking all the rules for a lead singer. Drinking whiskey all <laughs> well, the time, smoking cigars. I don't inhale them. Yeah. <laughs> but I do I do love a good cigar. <clears throat> I love a, a a great Dominican. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm dying to know what these are. Well, now we have to we have to choose a uh, we have to choose a favorite. So let's B. go let's go back. You're just going straight to B. You don't want to retaste? No. Okay. That B is spectacular. B B is spectacular for sure. Go back to A. I mean the A the color is beautiful. It really, I mean, I could. This would be a, 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 I think I, I like C. I like C over A. Mm -hmm. God, that the C is pretty interesting. But I think it's between C and B for me, and it's actually there's so much vanilla in B. There's, it's tighter than I thought it was going to be. It's kind of like just... B is a um, B is an acoustic set with you, whereas whereas C is a is a heavier version, uh, with a lot of drums, like a drum solo. That's a good example. It is There's intimacy to B, and C is just like punches you right in the face. I use the example sometimes with people. They're like, "So what's the difference between bourbon, rye, and and uh, sour mash?" And I'm like, "Bourbon's a nice rub on the back for your little, you know, hey, how you doing? It's good to see you." And rye is kind of like, "Hey, it's a little joke punch in the gut, you know, how you doing? It's good to see you." And then sour mash is just a smack across the face. <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to go with you and say B, but C is a very close second, very very close. Yeah. Uh, and A is a is a distant. Uh, I almost like in retasting A in comparison. I'm like, what the hell happened here to A? You know. It just makes me think, like I said earlier, Basil Hayden. Yeah, and that is the one of the greatest insults you can give to a, a whiskey, uh, calling it Basil Hayden, and that's why like says. this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's find out what these are. I actually have uh, – I will pull the bottles now and show you what they are without telling you which ones they are yet. Uh, Eagle Rare, 17-year-old from the I Buffalo have that collection. Oh, nice. I'm going to grab it right now. Awesome. <laughs> um, Wild Turkey 1. 
This is their limited edition that came out uh, that has like a like a, a toasted finish. That's really it's a beautiful bottle too. And then one of only three hundred ninety two bottles, a uh, special bottling of a smoke wagon, and you can see from the color. I think we know yeah, which one that was. That's we know what that was in. And get this: the proof is only ninety eight point seven proof. That's interesting. Yeah. It tastes a lot stronger. Yeah, it tasted like it was packing some heat. All mm -hmm. right, so let's let's find out. Got wild turkey. It's got to be B. What these are. Uh, glass B is the bottle you have at home, my friend. Eagle Rare. Eagle Rare 17-year-old. <gasps> so Eagle Rare 17-year-old is your champion. Our champion. Uh, C, as we kind of thought after seeing the color, is okay. uh, is Smoke Wagon, rare and limited, ten year old, and then. What's the bottle that for? You find it. Uh, these go in the secondary market between one and three thousand, but uh, I think the SRP on this is like two ninety nine or something. Yeah. But Beautiful. it's usually a secondary play. Uh, and then uh, obviously, Glass A. And it just didn't, I don't know what happened here, but uh, today is not its day. And nothing here was like uh, overly um, high proofed. Everything was like, you know, 101 or below. So, well, except for this one. Yeah, except for what you started with, right? The castring stuff. But I found it, I found it very interesting, like how this kind of played out. Now, if you were to compare them to the uh, Mictors that you had, and then the 291, would would Eagle Rare still be your favorite? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's it's so funny that I didn't even recognize that taste because I just had some last night, so maybe mine's. Well, you know, it's inter the interesting. Interesting thing about tasting is that the tasting is a product of the moment for you. You know, it can, in, you can taste things differently day to day, and like something can taste completely off. Uh, like the wild turkey one, I reviewed that and loved it. Like I would, if I would have reviewed it on today, I would have shit all over it. I mean, it was <laughs> nowhere near the complexity I recall. It's um, got like a candle box record. Yeah, I <laughs> know. <laughs> As you know, Candle Box was very good to me in my teenage years. Um, it was. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's very interesting because you're a product of a moment, how you're feeling, your mood, what you ate, what the weather's like. You know, I mean, think about how many times you were in Seattle and it was dreary out and slightly dripping. Oh my god! I gotta show you this because it's actually not the seventeen. Maybe that's why I didn't recognize it. Because uh, I'm looking at it. It's not. It's it's just the evil bear. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. Oh shit. That's got, why I didn't. That's why the, I didn't taste it. I mean, geez, did you wanna did you wanna get a a truck? That thing. <laughs> Damn. Well, because when you find it like this, like you know, why not? Yeah, you got you got the full blown leader right there. Holy it's shit. It's a magnum. Yeah. You 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 got the you got the big size. Yeah. So yeah. So, uh, so Eagle Rare, seventeen-year-old, is our champion here. It was unanimous. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, cheers, cheers to that. Yeah. Huh? Chin, chin, my friend. Cheers, indeed. Mm. So, what's upcoming? Well, what's uh, what's new um, that folks can expect? I have an acoustic tour starting on the twentieth in Cincinnati, not at Bogarts, but in another place. And then throughout the summer, just kind of one-offs, bouncing out. Uh, okay. Next year, we have the 30th anniversary of the debut album. So the original band is touring. Oh, wow. That's and awesome. there was, there's a documentary coming out uh, about uh, Candlebox as well. Oh, really? Where's that, where, where can that be seen? Well, Warner Brothers is, uh, is behind it. So the distribution, I think, is going to be small theatrical release, kind of like Wild, Wildflower. With yeah. Tom Petty was, and then it's either going to be Amazon or Netflix. Okay, great. And you know, I'm in Louisville, so easy story. easy drive for me to uh, to Cincinnati. Love to come see you. Oh, please, please do, man. If yeah. you come up, uh, I'll make sure we got some whiskey down in, in 
Have a uh, my my friend, I, I will not only bring the whiskey, I can bring you into a distillery and we can <laughs> take whiskey straight from the barrel there. If you got time. Let's do that. All right. All right, man. Well, hey, thanks for coming on. Um, it was great. Uh, it was great working with your team to get this all set up. You got a good bunch of people working with you. Thank you. And um, yeah, again, can't thank you enough for those teenage years. My, you. <laughs> How many times do you hear that in a week? Uh, at least twice. There you go. So I, I told you twice, so maybe it'll be a double week for you. Cheers, <laughs> my friend. Cheers, buddy. We'll see you. Cheers.